Hello everyone and welcome to uh, AV Motive Live number two. Uh, you want to get into writing about your adventures Hello and are you interested in Africa as a destination? Then please stay tuned to this edition of ADV Moto Live. All right, first thing up uh, in the news uh, is we have a message from the guys at Armchair Adventures. Um, I don't know if anyone here managed to catch some of the Armchair Adventures, uh, basically like a presentation video festival last weekend. It was amazingly successful. Uh, I believe the guys said that there was over 40,000 unique viewing sessions, and uh, which is Fantastic. I think a large part of that is uh, not only due to their efforts, but also to the amazing all-star cast um, that was just really cranking out some awesome stories. I mean, world-class stories. Uh, and we are fortunate to have some of those same people here with us this evening from various parts of the globe uh, as the magpie flies. Um, is an amazing artist, if you haven't heard of her, she says it was entirely awesome i agree it was entirely awesome and uh, scott.com says it was a great weekend it was a great weekend that is exactly how uh you do some entertainment during the coronavirus madness but to say thanks and wrap it up uh, we would like to share a little clip from reese and matt aka the sidecar guys um kind of giving you a touch point on what's going on next Hi everyone, Reese and Matt here, better known as the Sidecar Guys. Just a quick message to say thanks so much for tuning in to the very first Armchair Adventure Festival that uh, happened this weekend, just gone. Very first virtual adventure festival. It was a huge success. I think everyone enjoyed it. Who are your favourites, mate? My favourites? Well, I enjoyed Claudio von Planter. Um, I enjoyed the Charlie Borman set. I particularly enjoyed hearing a Q&A from Sam Manikin because there's so many stories there. It's good to hear sort of background to it. Um, Steph Jevons is probably my one of my favourites though. I think it's just mad how she managed to get that motorbike on those seven continents. And she's done some really interesting stuff since, like getting up to the Himalayas base camp. So the Everest base camp in the Himalayas. So really interesting stuff. Yeah, mm. it's funny you say that, mate, because for those of you who didn't manage to see it or wanted to go back and relive the experience, uh, unfortunately, the Armchair Adventure Festival has been taken off our YouTube channel now. However, starting this weekend. We'll be re-uploading the festival, uh, the main talks and the main interviews and that sort of thing. And we'll be starting with Steph Jevons. So that is <laughs> oh, so good news. That's a good little link there, mate, and good little plug. I like that. I hope we get some YouTube subscribers out of it. But while we're here, mate, we should just say a huge thanks to everyone from ADV Moto who did come over and watch it on the weekend. It must have been loads of you because we had thousands of people watch the stream over the weekend. And loads of you donated too, as well, I know. We raised £8,000 for the NHS Charities Together Fund. So it really has been fantastic. Hopefully put a bit of a dent in uh, this COVID-19 stuff. And it was just a brilliant weekend all in all. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, yeah, if you want to see more Sci-Kai Guy stuff, guys, head over to YouTube, subscribe, more Armchair Adventure Festival. And, yeah, hopefully you'll see more of us. Cheers, guys. See you there. All right, that was awesome that those guys had such a great weekend, uh, and we hope that there is more stuff coming from them uh, in the future. Uh, if there is, please stay tuned here. We will be sure to announce it. But on to our first news segment, or second, depending on how you see it. Um, we have a little bit of an interesting talk point, uh, which I always love to talk about small bikes and scooters. We love scooter adventuring. It's really awesome. The 2021 ADV 150 scooter by Honda uh, is rumored to be coming to America. Um, this is already popular elsewhere, um, but it's really nice to see that um, this is a strong addition uh, to an already growing scooter market in the United States. Actually, little 50cc scooters have been strong here for a long time for various reasons, bumming around communities uh, or for folks that have lost their license. Uh, 
you didn't need a license in America <laughs> to ride a little 50cc scooter. <laughs> and if you had to get to work or something, that was the way to do it. The mainstream uh, ADV media tends to focus on really large bikes, but there is a growing demand and acceptance of smaller bikes in both on- and off-road applications. Uh, that's another thing that we're happy to see. We will talk about this in a little bit, but we would really like to know what you think about uh, a smaller adventure scooter like this. Uh, would you own one? And if you did, would you take it off pavement? I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is kind of wild. I guess they're saying that this, this will be cons confirmed here for June. I guess that would be nice if it is. No, well, basically, um, you know, the ADV-150, I think, would be a great addition uh, to the market. And we would love to Farkle and test in, in ADV-150 at ADV Moto. Um, we know that um, s smaller scooters are uh, capable, perfectly capable of having awesome adventures. Many years ago, we had the pleasure of meeting a guy named Mike Saunders. I believe he was known as uh, Lost with Mike. And he's a local Virginia native who traveled from Virginia to the Keys to Dead Horse, and then I think down into Baja, Mexico, on a Ruckus 50 named La Tortuga. And um, I actually just heard from him yesterday. He is still scooting around on that 50. He's got over 70,000 miles on a Ruckus 50. It's been rebuilt a bunch of times. I would love to get him in here. Uh, if he's out there, give a shout. Um, and uh, we also recently saw in the Northeast VDR video, uh, there's a gentleman who was traveling across the country on one of the new Honda Super Cubs. And um, having traveled on 150s myself, um, it was pretty obvious to see he was having a great time. But, you know, um, people have been doing crazy things on small bikes with small motors um, basically ever since anyone stuck a motor on a bicycle, um, and we hope that that continues on. And um, going slowly gives you a chance to meet more people and get into more trouble, which, of course, makes for great content. That's right, makes for great content. Speaking of great content, our first guest spent eight years riding around the world. Um, he has authored four books Amazingly successful and available in different formats. Uh, Into Africa, Under Asian Skies, Distant Suns, uh, and Tortillas and Totems. He is often seen sharing his experiences in person uh, around the U.S. and Europe. Um, and so, everyone, please welcome Sam, the man, the samurai, Manicom. All right. Sam? All right, hold on a second. Getting him up. Okay, there he is. Sam, are you with oh, us? Oh, indeed. And Carl, you get worse. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I know. That's crazy. How are you doing today? I'm oh, really good, thanks. It's been an excellent day today. Oh, that's that's awesome. Uh, can you tell everyone where you're located? Um, at the so moment, you know. I'm in uh, a small city of Exeter, which is in the southwest of England. And uh, we've been having amazing weather. You can tell I'm from English stock because I'm immediately talking about the weather. But it's been absolutely fantastic until today. And it's binned it down with rain. And I said to Berger earlier on, I just hope it's not raining when we're recording this because um, I'm sitting underneath a sloping roof and with a sloping window. And it would have sounded as if we were actually under a tin roof. So um, we're doing very well so far. That's why I'm smiling so much. Well, that's awesome. You know, all, all that noise just, just would have sounded like authentic ambiance. Well, Tim and Marissa would have um, been quite at home with it. Rain on a tin roof by now, I should think. Yeah, right on, man. Right on. Well, you know, um, I think a lot of people may have heard you speak, um, you know, but uh, as it is, this is actually a growing and vast world of adventure. So I think it'd be cool just to give some kind of real general basic background on your life and experiences before, um, you know, start talking about, you know, tips with tips about writing, um, which you've been doing for a very long time, which is awesome. So what was the initial draw for you um, to, you know, hop on a motorcycle and just start bumming around the world? Um, it, it started really pretty much when I realized that I didn't have any responsibilities and I didn't have any debt and beer was involved with that. And I was sitting in the pub and just um, knocking back a few as you do. And um, those two thoughts floated through my mind. And I thought, well, you know, you're 34 years old. How rare is it to be without debt and without responsibility? 
um, maybe it's time that you actually did something um, in the travel world again. And I, I've actually spent most of my life traveling in one way or another. My first solo trip was when I was 16 years old. I've traveled with bicycles and um, hitchhiked and bussed and trained and sailed and cars and, and so on. So while I was sitting there knocking back the beer, I was just thinking about the things that I didn't like about traveling with those forms of transport, like riding a bicycle, I love it. It's brand fantastic. You see so much when you're going along that slowly and it's cheap, etc. Although of course you eat a ton and that's not necessarily so cheap, but um, <laughs> just um, riding into a headwind for 12 days. Okay, I've done that. And I, mm. I started to think about, well, what could I find as a way of tra traveling that would give me a complete new set of challenges and deal with the things that I didn't necessarily enjoy so much about the other forms of transport? And it kept on coming back to riding a motorcycle. And, um, mm. Yeah, I kind of got stuck on that. And um, passed, handed my notice in the next morning, passed my test six weeks later, and six weeks after that, I was sitting at the edge of the Sahara Desert looking south and thinking, Sam, you idiot. What have you done? No. Oh. Man, that's amazing. What was your first bike? Um, I learned to ride on a little Kawasaki KDX 125. And I love that bike and I really wish I hadn't sold it. This thing was so fast and it was so friendly to use, incredibly light. Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I later realized that it would have been an absolutely rubbish bike to go the length of Africa on because these things were thirsty as anything but it was a lot of fun to learn to ride on. I had one lesson and that was to teach me how to change gear and the rest I learned by making mistakes and amazingly from time to time getting something right. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's nice when that happens for all of us from time to time, you know? But uh, so so you've traveled extensively, you've, you've written a lot of books. So, I mean, how many, I mean, you know, how many continents, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, what are some of your what are some of your favorite locations that that you've been to over the years that kind of inspired you to ride? Wow, um, that's incredible, incredibly different. There are very few places that I wouldn't want to go back to. Jail in Tanzania is um, about the only place that I don't want to go back to. Everywhere else mm. has always had something really special about it. Um, the, the desert in Namibia, for example, it is just drop dead gorgeous. Monument Valley. Um, Glacier National Park, uh, the Himalayas, uh, outback yeah. Australia. Just you could just go right the way around the world, thinking, "Wow, one day after the next." And to me, that's one of the real joys about travelling on a motorcycle. You are literally moving from one smile moment to the next. Yeah, and then so out of all the travels, I mean, what are some of the biggest things that you've that you've learned? Uh, you know, from like from travelling all of these years. I think the first thing is that when you're planning to do a trip, work out what you what you really want from the trip. Have ambitions, but don't let those ambitions become railway tracks. Because as soon as you do that, yeah, okay, you've got some lovely goals and you've done your research, you know what you're heading into and what the possibilities are. But if you put yourself on railway tracks, then you miss the opportunities. And one of the joys about traveling with a motorcycle is seeing those side turnings and thinking, I can. So I will, mm. and off you head. And there were side turnings on, on the trip that I headed off down sometimes for a couple of weeks at a time. Fantastic, because I had the freedom to do it. Um, so yeah, those two things. Um, if you have a dream, instead of asking yourself, why not? Ask yourself, why not? There's a big difference between those two things. And we tend to to be brought up in societies which teach us to look for all of the problems first instead of looking for all of the possibilities and as yeah. soon as you start rolling those opportunities turn up and you think why on earth was i worried so worried about this now i'm not talking about losing common sense common sense is something really important and actually i think most of us forget that we've got that sense but when you're out on the road the road hones it it encourages your common sense to bubble to the surface. And the more you travel, the more that common sense um, teaches you how to be safe and how to take advantage of opportunities. Um, oh, oh yeah, and, and also instinct, sorry to interrupt, yeah. um, you know, but yeah, but I mean, how do, how do you think adventure travel um, kind of honed or develop your instincts, either social instincts or just kind of like environmental awareness instincts? One of the things that I, travel has taught me is uh, always, respect the people that you meet respect them straight away and it doesn't matter what they're dressed like 
Um, they can be dressed in rags or they can be dressed in the most officious police uniform that you've ever seen. Treat those people with respect because you have no idea what's going on behind that surface. You could be scared of the person that you're facing, but in actual fact, they're probably just as likely to be scared as you and they're being defensive because they don't know who you are either. So treat them with respect. And obviously, if you common sense, that instinct is, is shouting at you, no, steer clear of this person, then yeah, politely, quietly make your exit. Follow that instinct, but actually let your instincts open yourself up and yeah, respect the people and trust the people in front of you until they prove that they can't be trusted. So many brilliant opportunities happen as a direct result of doing that. Oh yeah, you'll miss a lot if you go around in the world thinking that everyone is an adversary. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. Yeah. Uh yeah, and it's uh, and it's and it's serious. So what, what did you know? What made you start writing? And um, you know, when you set out on your journey, were you thinking I'm going to write a book about this stuff? No way! I was too busy learning how not to fall off a motorcycle to think about writing anything. <laughs> I spent the first six yeah. months of the trip um, with a bike telling me what to do. I was just hanging on the back like some sort of motorcycle accessory, trying not to fall off. The bike was telling me what to do. No, but seriously, um, previous trips had taught me the value of writing a diary, writing a journal every day because you're on intake overload. I mean, anybody who's yeah. watching here now, think back to two weeks ago and ask yourself if you can clearly describe what you were doing at this moment two weeks ago. And most of us can't do it. And when you're on the road, you're on, you're on just such intake overload all day, every day it's really easy to forget what's going on. So writing a journal is absolutely vital. Otherwise you forget how things sound and how they smell and what a person looks like or um, just how you felt at a particular moment. And you know, sometimes writing a journey, journal feels like an awfully daunting thing to do, but the trick with it is not to feel that you have to write reams every day. There are some days where the words just flow and you, you're sitting under that neath that shady tree and you've got the warm breeze floating around you and the words are flowing. But there are other days where you're absolutely knackered because it's been a full on day. And on those days, still write a journal, but just write 20 key words. Those 20 key words will be enough to bring back most of the memories. So writing the journal was the most important thing. And the books really started as a result of magazine articles. I got mm. stuck on a camping site in the middle of the city of Delhi in India. And uh, mm. I was chasing after a visa for Iran. And at the time, Margaret Thatcher had upset the Iranians and um, the Iranians weren't too keen on giving Brits visas. So they were messing me around a little bit. I felt a little bit like a yo-yo between the camping site and various parts of India and the uh, Iranian embassy in, in Delhi. But um, this camping site was a real crossroads for overlanders and you had people on motorcycles, bicycles, four by fours. And every night we'd all sit around and we'd swap stories and pick brains about where people had come from, especially if we were heading in that direction. And one night, one of the girls said to me, Sam, so many mad things happened to you. You should write some articles. And I thought, well, mm. why not? There's no better place to do this. And I carried on writing those articles um, for that magazine for the rest of the trip. So for another five years, just whenever I was free enough to do it. So the articles didn't take over. Um, when I got back to the UK, the editor of the magazine uh, wrote me um, uh, or phoned me and said, Sam, uh, we're getting letters and emails from uh, readers saying they like your articles and they want to know when your book's coming out. Well, the expression on my face must have been absolutely gobsmacked because it was, what book? I had no idea about writing a book and I didn't even think I, I could. I got the worst possible grade mm. in English language at school that you could get and still pass. <laughs> so, um, but, it's, but this is one of the things that travel teaches you. If you don't try, you never find out. So I tried. I thought, well, let's have a go. Maybe I can. And to my amazement, people liked what I was doing. So um, that was a, a, a lucky lesson to have learned on the road. Yeah, that's awesome. Did now I know that you know every adventure experience is is different, and to a certain extent, all of them are unique in terms of you know even if you went back on that exact same route during the say even say the exact same time of year, you would never have the same experience. You would meet different people, right? You would have different weather. Uh, you would you would have different politics, and you know I mean I mean all these things. But um, 
it definitely has an emotional impact on you as a traveler and i believe as a solo traveler too right uh, we, we, i think almost all these travels you, you were on solo right um nearly all of the trips pre the motorcycle trip i was solo sometimes i'd link up i traveled with a, a girlfriend for three sure. months for example but the first four years right. of the eight year trip was mostly on my own sometimes i was traveling with other people um, Mike and Sally were the people that I traveled with the longest and I met them at the beginning of the trip and traveled down through North Africa with them. What a brilliant stroke of luck that was. But uh, the rest of the sure. trip was pretty much on my own until I met Birgit. Um, on your own, yeah. You know, the, the solo kind of mentality, um, you know, it doesn't give you a whole lot of room to create a cultural bubble around yourself, right? right. So, you know, yeah, so all the experiences you have really just kind of go you know, through you. I mean, they really kind of penetrate you for not, you know, always being able to have, uh, you know, s someone with a similar language skill that you can talk to and, and, and lean on and even to reflect experiences culturally, you know what I'm saying? And I always felt that these things are, 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 are full of the, the potential to have a deeper impact. And, then, you know, how do you, how do you see the um, emotion or depth of your experiences impact your writing? You, you find out an awful lot about yourself when you're traveling solo. Um, you find out thing, you, how much resilience you've got. You find out how much compassion you've got and how far you want that compassion to take you. You find out how open you can be to possibilities. And you can also find out how darn lazy you can be and what a chicken you can be too, because there are some days where you just hole up in, in your tent and you just don't leave because you need a holiday, a mental holiday from everything that's going on out there. And when you're on your own, that mental holiday is really important because you haven't got anybody to, to share, uh, to share with. Mm, yeah. Awesome. So out of all this, this giant bundle of awesome experiences and all these books that you've written, uh, could you give us a few tips on, uh, on, on, on those of us who are, you know, getting, getting set to, uh, go on trips or we've already been on trips and 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 we really want to assemble something um, that represents our experience okay yeah for sure and one of the things that i love about having written the books and bouncing around doing presentations and things is that it's a fantastic opportunity to share and most of the things that i've learned along the way have been taught to me by other people so it's an absolute joy to have an opportunity each time to pass the, these thoughts on to other people and the first one of course was write that journal every day when you get to the end of your journey you're going to need all of those little descriptions the quirky moments the way things smell the way they sounded like i said the way you felt at those moments because when you're writing, it's really important that you bring the senses alive. Um, you can make somebody feel like you're, they're there with you on the journey if they can smell those smells with you, if they can feel that warm breeze on your skin through the way that you're describing it. And it's very difficult to forget those things, or very easy to forget those things if you haven't got those moments written down in your journal. One of the things that I think is a really good idea for people to do before they go on a trip, if they're planning to write a book, is to do um, some research for quirky things that they can link up with along the way. Now, one of the examples, it's, it's an off-the-wall -wall, off one, but let's say you're planning to travel the length of South America. Why don't you do some research and find out where all the fiestas are in South America mm. and try and make those plan your route for you. Just think about how many amazing stories and how much wonderful stuff you can get going on in a book because of those fiestas, the history of them, the photographs, the magazine articles, all of those sorts of things. You might be a locomotive engineer at home, so why not plan your journey to link up with locomotive um, workshops and railway stations or whatever else it is? And the other reason I'm saying that is because not only does it give you a really quirky thread to follow, but one of the things that's great about writing a book is if you can get your book open to several different readerships. So you might get the motorcycle people, you might get the adventure people, but then you'll get the locomotive people. And so it goes on. And that means your book yeah. has that much more chance of being um, successful. The next thing is learn how to take photographs. Taking photographs are absolutely vital because 
your book, we, we live in a really visual age and your book um, needs to have graphics and it needs to have photographs. If they're black and white photographs in the book, great. Black and white photographs are that much harder to take, so learn how to do it. If you're going to make your book a success, then it really helps you if you've had magazine articles published before your book comes out, because mm. then you've already built some awareness of who you are and what you've been up to. And you can't get magazine articles published without decent photographs. So learn photography. Yeah. The next key thing is when you sit down to write your book, get yourself a turret in a castle with a steel door that nobody can come into. So in other words, what you're creating <laughs> is an environment where you can be totally on your own and you can let all of those thoughts bubble into your mind. Um, just come alive again. Every time somebody interrupts you or uh, you, you're losing a thread of thought, whatever else it is, potentially you're losing the best description that you will have had for that situation. I've done it myself so many times and I've kicked myself. And sometimes when I'm writing, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I have this great memory that pops into my mind. And if I don't wake up and get out of bed and go and write it down there and then, by the morning I've lost it. So one of the things I also think is when you're writing your book is to walk around with a notebook in your pocket because those thoughts can mm. come upon you anytime. Jot it down before you forget it because you won't half kick yourself. It's like writing a chapter and forgetting to save it on your laptop when it's gone. You'll never write that chapter as well. The next thing um, I think is people get very hung up on um, grammar and punctuation and getting those things right. Forget it. If you're not a natural at those things, don't worry about it. Just brainstorm. Let the words come out. Let the descriptions come out. Let the feelings come out and just just let them flow because that's you being natural. And if you're being natural, the reader is much more likely to get swept along with you with those descriptions. You can always go back and sort out the grammar and put the full stop or the comma in different places. All of that sort of stuff can yeah. be done after. But just let those feelings and those thoughts flow out of you. That book has that much more chance of being um, a success. Now, writing a book is the fun bit. Working <laughs> with an editor things start to change and if you're lucky you'll end up the right yeah. royal bastard as an editor somebody who's going to yeah. rip you to shreds you can't be precious when you start working with an editor and it really pays to work with somebody who's going to be hard-nosed with you now i'm not calling my editors i've had two in over my books i'm not calling them bastards but i think that they would be kind of proud if they watch this yeah. and they're listening in and they think that that's what i think of them because they've been fantastic yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize actually how much work editing is. And, you know, because a lot of the self-publishing has become uh, so easy and so kind of like popular recently, um, that's like one of those steps that has gone by the wayside in, you know, in some books that I've read. And it's kind of unfortunate. There's a great story there. But without editing, it makes it harder to read through it. Like a good editor will, will address things like flow or things that the writer understands but the reader might not necessarily understand because it's not fully described or something like that. And that's, and that's really important to think about. You're writing from outside of your perspective. I, I've had sent, I've had comments, emails from um, my last editor, uh, Paul, Sam, this bit's rubbish, take it out. And I've really liked that bit, mm. but then it's down to me because I haven't written it well enough so he can see why I'm proud enough to actually want this story into to, in the book so that's down to me and that's one of the things an editor does an editor is also going to stop you ranting and rambling and every writer mm -hmm. does that more than perhaps they should do um, in one of my books i wrote two chapters and my editor got it down to half a chapter and he was so right because it had gone wow. off on it and i was just wasting space it was going to be incredibly boring for the reader so editors need to do that but they're also doing things like i like this bit can you write some more on it? Fantastic, because they're seeing it with those fresh eyes and that's the, that's part of the buzz. Um, sure, sure. Well, the, the, sorry I cut short, but um, before we bring in the next guest, uh, we've got some, uh, we have a question here. Um, well, in a statement, scott.com said, 
he just finished all four of Sam's books during the lockdown here. <laughs> and, um, and he says he would strongly recommend them if people haven't read them yet. So in a marathon, four books during lockdown is awesome, and that's great. Um, and then uh, Paul Moore asks, Sam, uh, where would you go on your next big trip? Ooh. How long have we got, Paul? Um, <laughs> I, I still have um, a real hankering to ride up the east side of South America. Um, mm. I haven't been down the west side of Africa, and I was born in central West Africa, and I would love to go back to that part of the world. Don't be shocked at me for this, but I, I'm really looking forward to getting back to the United States too. Every time I get to the States, I discover something else that's fantastic. And for me, the USA is one of those countries where every day I can wake up with no idea what I'm going to see that day. And I can go through multiple climate zones. For example, I can go yeah. through one culture after the next on a day's ride in the United States. And I, I really like riding there. So I hope that's not uh, disappointing or surprising anybody too much. Oh, hell yeah, man. Uh, you know, actually all of North America is great. Uh, and if it wasn't for lockdown, gas is really cheap right now. It is, it is. <laughs> you could travel forever on a motorcycle with like 10 bucks right now because the cost of gas is so low. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. Well, all right, Sam, uh, that was awesome. Um, uh, what we would like to do uh, now is uh, bring in our next guests, keep things uh, moving along. Thank you very much for those awesome tips. Uh, who's it? Scott. Scott.com said, uh, damn, Sam, those are some great tips. Uh, and uh, and then we got folks talk about the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Pete West Jr. says the Rocky Mountains. And uh, and then there's a Michael Baker uh, says we need to get Sam up in New England. Have you been in New England? Just real fast. I have, but a long time ago. I'd love to get back up that way. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right. Well, um, don't want to waste too much time here. Uh, got to keep things rolling along. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into our next guests. And uh, hailing from Chicago, uh, our feature guests uh, were recently married, uh, and they're currently stuck in Uganda on their honeymoon of sorts. Um, they have also authored a couple of books, Two Up, Overloaded, Maiden Voyage, and A Road Guide Through Peru. Uh, we would like to welcome Tim and Marissa Notier, and, um, but before we do, we would like to play a short clip from their travels. All right, we've got Sam there. Uh, Tim and Marissa, can you speak up real quick? Yes. Hello. There they are. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we got Tim and Marissa up in there. Let's go ahead and switch out uh, to the main view, and let's get everybody in here. All right, we've got the party started here. It's the party line. <laughs> it's the chat party line. How are you guys doing? You guys are in Uganda? Yeah. 
All right, Sam's already celebrating. Are, are, are you guys in Uganda now? We are indeed, yeah. Uh, we've been All right. we're just over a month now at this exact location. But uh, no, good spirits, good times. All right, that's cool. So, you know, uh, I mean, that, that, that's a hell of a thing to get stuck in there. Um, I mean, you guys pretty much have a feeling that this was going to happen when you went in there or, or, or what? Um, yeah, we knew this was going to happen as we started heading north through the eastern side of Africa. I think in Tanzania, we started hearing a lot of rumors about this coronavirus. By the time we were in Rwanda, we realized we're going to get stuck somewhere. Uh, the DRC closed its borders while we were there. They were one of the first countries in this region to do so. And so mm. we had to make a choice. Where are we going to be stuck? Are we going to go home? And we chose Uganda. And so far, we're pretty happy with that choice. Very cool. I mean, what what makes Uganda, you know, a cool place to get, uh, you know, to get uh, kind, of, kind of laid out? And as Sam was talking about earlier, uh, you know, how much... He really enjoyed Uganda, uh, you know, but there's so many people that don't know much about it. I mean, can you can can you guys give us a, you know, like a breakdown about about how that country compares to other countries in the region? A lot of the national parks here, they still have big game and giraffes and hippos and, and, and such. And Uganda is one of the first places where you can actually ride through the national parks on your motorcycle. And so it's extremely exciting for the potential. We sadly... We're kind of in a rush and, and didn't see any lions, but after this is all done, we'll do some more figure eights. But uh, seeing a giraffe on a motorcycle is just a different experience than in a car. I mean, obviously. Did you word that, Tim? What's that? I've just got this wonderful image of a giraffe riding a, uh, a motorcycle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> seeing, a giraffe, seeing a giraffe riding a motorcycle. <laughs> Sounds like a work for a cartoonist. <laughs> Sure. Did, did you go down into the Elizabeth National Park? We did, yes. We did. That's a really <laughs> special place. They have uh, the only lions in the world that climb trees. So they'll be hanging out, sleeping in the trees. Unfortunately, we didn't see any the day that we were there. But we do plan, once this lockdown is a little bit loosened, to ride back through Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Nice. And we entered through Bwindi, uh, the Penerbal Forest. We we penetrated, and that was <laughs> an amazing national park as well. Uh, they have gorillas there. They have gorillas and, and monkeys. And yeah, just wildlife is, is abundant. We actually had our own little resident monkey here where we're staying. Sadly, he's he's exploring elsewhere at the moment, but uh, yeah. Oh, he'll be back. Just put something valuable. <laughs> around outside <laughs> and you go try and take it back he'll get angry at you <laughs> that's, that's that's awesome yeah there's life with monkeys and then there's life without monkeys right yeah. there are no monkeys in north america we're definitely lacking monkeys in north america maybe we should import some or something like that yeah yeah that's awesome so where are some of the best places to visit and ride um you know like in Africa, it's on my short list of places uh, to see. I've, I've never, uh, you know, been there. Um, spending most of my time in Asia, um, and I've always had this had this kind of dream of of, of playing the djembe with some Maasai. And uh, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to you know figure out like, man, if you were going to go ride in Africa, I mean, where would be some hot places to go? Well, we started in South Africa, and for us, one of our favorite places to ride is a little country called Lesotho. It's inside of South Africa, and it's extremely mountainous. Um, <clears throat> the roads there, it goes from everything from perfect pavement all the way to the worst road you can imagine. So you can really have your pick, but some of those roads are just so smooth, and they're winding through the mountains. It's a very small country, so you can just make little loops around, but we loved the suit. Yeah. It had a combination of uh, beautiful scenery, excellent roads for motorcycles, uh, an amazing people. Uh, they, they, the movie in Black Panther, the Wakanda, was kind of loosely based off of their 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 outfits, which is a little fun. Oh, cool! But they do they wear like the the flannel capes. They have you know they they just very cool culture there. 
they look very stoic. Their blankets look like these capes in the wind and yes. they have their big staffs and they're herding their animals. <laughs> and then they wave to you as you go by. It's just wonderful. No, no. This is very cool. uh, Dave, Dave Weinberg asks, would you want to see a lion when you're on a motorcycle? I've seen pictures of other... S Sam says yes. <laughs> Sam's giving more lions on motorcycles. As long as <laughs> Chasing running. giraffes on motorcycles. As long as my engine's running, Cole. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. So it's always in Africa, you're not allowed to ride your motorcycle in the national park specifically because of the lions. Because you're a big cat toy at that point. Exactly. Yeah, well, I yeah. think Queen Elizabeth is here in Uganda is a little bit special, but I've heard that it's because these lions are a bit more timid. They do like to stay up in trees. They're a little bit different. Um, but so a lion is a lion you. is a lion in my book. Yeah. No, I don't know. I think it would be cool. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd be paranoid. I would, I would, you know, be the deer in headlights. But I think I'd get a couple shots in. As long as I live through it, I'm okay <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sam, have you had any cool lion encounters? Um, when Mike and Sally and I were coming down through northern Kenya, um, Mike's uh, bike, the the negative had come off his battery, so he'd he'd um, discharged his battery. And um, we ended up riding into the Ooh. dark and we rode through a national park, uh, which we weren't really supposed to be doing, but we could hear the lions not too far off in the bush, which was quite a spooky feeling. But to be honest, we weren't really that bothered. We were so busy focusing on just keeping his bike going because, of course, every time we rode into the soft sand or something like that, then the bike, yeah, it was hard to keep going. So we were more bothered about that than we were what the lions were up to. We think they were just having a party out there. It was fine. Yeah, while well, riding at night, I'm sure in, in some of those areas must be hairy because you know, I mean, there are date, there are was it diurnal animals, and then there's the nocturnal animals, <laughs> and those are, those guys are a little different. You know what I Almost mean? Almost never ever do it. It is just not worth it. You 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 can't see. It's like turning one of your senses off. And besides that, hey, this landscape's beautiful. Why would you want to go through it in the dark? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um. We've got uh, a question from scott.com for both of you guys. Is it, do you all have a crossing the equator moment? When we crossed here in uh, Uganda, because when we'd gone through the Americas and we went through Ecuador, we had actually missed the uh, monument that they have there. So here in Uganda, it was a really rough day for us. Tim wasn't feeling very well, but I'm like, we have to see the marker of the equator and and sam i think i've seen a picture of you in front of the concrete little half dome crater and everybody parks their bike and smiles now that is moved somewhere else and there's a picture of that there mm -hmm. and so you pull your bike up in front of a picture of yeah. what you see. and so yeah i was a i wasn't feeling very well and b i didn't really care for a picture of me in front of a picture of a thing I've seen other people actually in front of, but, but, uh, um, yeah, it was, disappointing. <laughs> was, it was, it was I, I like, I like crossing hemispheres. So it's always fun. Yeah. When you get into Kenya, right on, right on. enjoy the, the equator crossing in Kenya, cause there'll be lots of signs and don't forget to do the bowl of the water and the swirling um, motion in, in that as well. When you're there. Yeah. So does that actually yeah, it work? Does. It's amazing. I was gobsmacked. I didn't expect it. I'm a real cynic about things like that. Really? It was kind of... Yeah, so what happened? Either go this way or that way. Yep. Yeah, I thought it was yeah, a so... type of sleight of hand thing, but I no, don't know. No way. Come on, stop spoiling my innocence. <laughs> yeah, spoiling my... Sam's got all this innocence left over. <laughs> We're all spoiling it. <laughs> That's awesome. So what happens? Does the water like fly up in the air and explode or something or what? I mean, how exciting is this? I mean, and north of the equator, it drains one way and south of the equator, it drains the other because of the difference in the magnetic pull. Yeah. Yeah. It's what happens when you're on the equator, though. Yeah, right. Can, I mean, that's the thing. You, right? You've got to step a couple of yards to either side and um, the difference is phenomenal. Oh, wow. So so if you stir the bowl and you're literally on the equator, does it just spin and... No, it stands completely still. Or... All you're doing is getting concentric rings. It's it's quite incredible. Oh, wow. That is pretty cool. 
something for all of us to put on our list of things to do and, and, and try out for sure. Um, well, all right. Well, you know, with all this really cool stuff, are there any areas there that you would currently want to avoid in Africa? Avoid is a strong word. I mean, we're both yeah. from Chicago, right? And so there's places we just, to, you know, we would avoid. Um, but Sam was talking about street smarts earlier, you know, and I, I do think that just common sense. We, between us, we call it our, our spidey sense, you know, like, you know, if, if we get a feeling in the back of our neck that something just isn't right, uh, we, we tend to move on without questions asked just because it's just, it's better for both of us. We have not felt any threats anywhere on this continent or in South America, Central America. Uh, there's areas that we chose not to go to, which could be debated on different opinions. Like we didn't go to Joburg. Um, that was just not a city that I was drawn to. And again, we were from a big city and, you know, big cities are, are high population, high traffic, pollution, crime, and I'm not cost. Yeah. And I'm not spitting out saying, don't, don't ever go to Joburg and Joburg's bad. That is not my, my point at all. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I, I do think by knowing some of the riskier places and we avoid them. I know this is all in the adventure spirit. We, we are adventurous, but you know, like there's just certain places that uh, we've avoided on purpose, but wouldn't tell anybody not to go to. I think, I think what yeah. you're saying makes an awful lot of sense. You know, there are countries in Africa that you just don't want to be going to. Um, Somalia, for example, why on earth would you go through, through Somalia at the moment? Um, and every city has its dodgy areas. Well, you know, this city has its dodgy area and it's tiny. I know Chicago does. I've been there. Um, not, not necessarily to the dodgy areas, but you, those senses <laughs> that you're talking about were tingling. And something that you said that interested me just now was that you get that um, spidey feeling. That's one of the things I think that keeps you safe more than you realize, perhaps, in that if you don't look like a victim, you're less likely to be a victim. So if your spidey senses are working and you're getting out of dodge because they're telling you to, then you're not behaving like a victim. And that, that means you're less attractive to the, to the guys who want to take advantage. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man, we should all have a drink to our spidey senses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Seriously, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're on it. I will, I will actually do that here too myself. <laughs> <laughs> why the hell not it's just water in a cup but um yeah you know i mean um you know uh when i was riding around the himalayans um you know there was all these you know little small isolated you know uh, kind of like villages and hamlets that were just kind of tucked up into the hollows and the in the valleys and i think one thing that i noticed was uh look at the little kids in the town like if you ride through an area and the parents start pulling your little kids in that's it. That's an immediate sign. It's just like, this thing is not right. You know, like they're not welcoming, you know, but if you go somewhere and the kids are waving at you and they're, you know, chasing you down the street on the bike and you stop and, you know, and they're coming up to you and stuff like that, that's, that's generally like a good sign. But I found that like from one town to the next, it was very different. I mean, I mean, it could even only be maybe, um, maybe, uh, you know, a uh, hundred miles or kilometers away, but because they're so isolated that, you know, sometimes the feelings can be very different. Have you guys ever had that experience? I think that's a really good point. And it made me remember how sometimes as a woman traveling, I'm always on the lookout for other women. And even if they're just local women walking through the street, that sounds kind of sexist, but I feel a little bit safer. <laughs> and I think that goes along with your point of the little kids. Um, it is something to look out for, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty wild. So, are there any cultural do's and don'ts that you know uh, that, that that someone uh, should know uh, while they are in Africa versus roaming the wilds of Chicago? Hmm. What do you think, Sam? I mean, I, I we pretty much do day to day stuff. I mean, it's basic etiquette, right? Is don't be don't don't be a jerk to people and people won't be jerk to you. But if you, if you come across people with a smile right off the bat, it makes it pretty hard for them to, you know, 
be upset with you and, and escalate into something that isn't pleasant. But uh, I don't think I'm smart enough not to do anything <laughs> that would have. So there's, there's, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure, Sam. Have you come across anything when you were in Africa? In Africa, one of the keys that we came across was that a handshake goes a very, very long way. Um, for, for everybody, um, even the kids, love a handshake. And we found that people who were looking at us as being potentially pompous white foreigners, as soon as we gave them a smile and a handshake, that just melted away. And you had people that you were really comfortable communicating with. You get rid of any sense of superiority and people warm to you very quickly in Africa, don't they? And Africans love a laugh, don't they? I don't know whether yeah. you've picked up on this. You must have, but there's laughter going on all the time, all over the place, isn't there? Yeah. I think one of the other um, no-nos in Africa is not to walk around with loads of bling on. If you have mm. an expensive watch and a, a neck chain and all of this sort of thing, then mm. you're just making yourself a walking target. And when we came on on air i was looking at what you two guys are dressed like and i was just thinking yeah for africa it's perfect um yeah it's it no. works clean neat tidy not fancy and that just doesn't pay you any dividends does it that, absolutely if you if you flash your bling you're gonna get got right <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> that's right that's exactly right. Well, that's a good tip pretty much anywhere i think yeah, man yeah it's an honor to be called not fancy by sam and that is life <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a t-shirt sounds like a t-shirt not fancy by <laughs> sam that's right that's awesome that's awesome well um you know guys uh want want to try to wrap it up here uh pretty fast it's, it's already been about an hour it's like uh, four in the morning for 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 tim and marissa and sam i'm i think it's it's about what there it's about one two yeah it's about 10 to 2 something like that for tim and marissa oh, well then they might as well not go to bed the dawn in africa is wonderful isn't it <laughs> yes. yeah exactly yeah exactly right exactly right well um we do have a question from as the magpie flies um who uh if she's interested we would love to actually have her on Evie yeah. moto yeah. live it'd be really cool but she wants to know um uh what are some of tim and marissa's favorite places in South America, favorite places in South America. So yeah, add another half hour to the show. But there's my favorite place. I think differs in Marissa's, uh, just being two separate individuals. But uh, Peru to me had all the natural beauty I could have ever expected when daydreaming about myself being on an adventure motorcycle in some far off land. And my mind imagined me in some weird hobbit landscape of just insanity that I just made up. And then I found myself in some of these mountain passes in Peru and my imagination could not create the places that we were at. It was just, it was absolutely mind blowing. I just, Peru and Patagonia for that matter, once you get further south, but Peru will always hold some deep, deep memories that will never be burned away. Peru holds yeah, right great memories for me too. And he's absolutely right about the nature. It is where I hurt my foot. So for me, I think um, Colombia actually wins out in the favorites um, because the people were so nice. It's also very beautiful. The culture is so vibrant. Um, it's hard to say because we loved every place in south america so much we really had a blast there but yeah colombia would be and, my number one and to build on colombia because it was amazing like uh we actually went into colombia with i won't say low expectations but we had just seen narcos and you know like whatever there's all these tv shows that have painted it in a bad light and we were like well we're not going to go down any windy twisty gravel roads into the middle of nowhere because we don't know who we're going to run into and uh, once we got into a couple of cities and the, the, the children in the street, the people smiling, the pe like their felt hats and like, like just everything was just absolutely amazing. And we did just the opposite of what we thought we were going to do. And, and we, we, we went to every small village off in the middle of nowhere. It was, and, and so 
just to go from like, I don't know, we should go through Columbia relatively quickly to, oh my God, pump the brakes and let's just do figure eights around this, this entire country because it was fantastic. Awesome. And I saw Sam give a thumbs up there. Sam, do you have any thoughts on Columbia as well? When we went into Columbia, it was just when things were beginning to get a little bit more relaxed there. Um, Birgit was very nervous about it because everything in the news over the last two years had been, you know, the, 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 the bandits and kidnappings and all of the rest of it. But um, I read up on Colombia and I really wanted to go there. It's one of the most geographically diverse countries um, in the world. And uh, we were we were we were meeting other people who were coming towards us and they were saying, actually, you know, it's not bad. There are certain areas that you don't go into. Um, going back to the conversation we were just having and we went in and we were we had a ball we were blown away um by the hospitality the beauty the opportunities the history the buildings um yeah it's just a really exciting country but that's south america every single country is completely different to the next which is one of the things that if you've got the time and i respect you too for giving the time to this continent you have a chance to explore and really suck it dry because it's so full of opportunities, isn't it? 100%. Yes. 100%. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, guys, uh, with that, let's go ahead and wrap up the show. Um, basically, you know, thanks, uh, Sam, Tim, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, Marissa uh, for taking the time to appear tonight uh, despite these crazy time differences. Um, again, uh, you can follow their continued adventures at sam-manicom.com as well as notearsfrontiers.com. Um, in the meantime, uh, please join us again next week. We're going to talk about racing, how to get into it, get some tips from some experts. And uh, please visit adventuremotorcycle.com for all things ADV. Send us a note if there's a topic you would like to see us cover or if you would like these uh, to be longer. I feel like, man, there's such awesome awesome talent and people on here. I think we should just give more, more time to speak, but don't forget to subscribe uh, to ADV Moto uh, YouTube channel, ring the notification bell to keep up the date with ADV Moto live. And until next time, uh, good night to our guests and...